This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, uh, my task here is to uh, invite us to stop for a second or a few minutes to, uh, to consider how we got from uh, the petulant Liberace of the pre previous regime to characters who are running Iranian politics today, Khamenei, Jannati, Mesbah Yazdi, who could be best probably described as, uh, I don't know, a series of Rasputins, uh, but minus the charm. Uh, so in other words, what I want to do is to stop and, and ask what happened in the um, current uh, crisis in Iran, and what happened in the last 30 years that we made this transition. The Iranians came out into the streets and uh, uh, with a genuine revolution brought about a change to the previous regime. How did we get stuck with uh, this regime and what is this regime doing right now? Uh, the title of my talk is uh, Future of an Illusion. Uh, indeed, uh, what I am trying to say is that uh, this uh, regime should be likened to, a, to the fabulous giant of, uh, of the stories that ended up breaking the jar that contained its own life. And this jar was the jar of democracy. Uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, after this election, uh, is basically a dead man walking. Uh, and this was the penultimate act, the final act being its passing into the, into the historical memory. This was the penultimate act of a Shiite gambit to emerge into the, from the obscurity of a millenarian, quiet his faith into the daylight of the 20th century uh, politics of the Middle East. You see, the Islamic Republic was never a solid theocracy. Unlike Vatican, uh, the Islamic Republic did not have a claim to represent an apostle with his biblical powers to loose and bind. It did not have the secular authority based on the story of Constantine uh, who on his merry way from uh, Rome to Constantinople apparently had given the secular authority to the, uh, to the Pope Sylvester. Vatican had actually this document in its vaults uh, and uh, ruled on that basis that uh, it had been given the power to rule the secular world by uh, Constantine. Well, the document turned out to be uh, a fake it was, uh, it was not a correct, uh, it, was, it, it was a forgery, but the Vatican had that and ruled by that for, for uh, centuries. Uh, I, I have a feeling that Dan Brown could make a, a movie about this uh, in his next uh, installment. Uh, but uh, unlike Vatican, the Islamic Republic was not based on a, on a strong theological basis because Shiite Islam for the entirety of its history was, with minor uh, exceptions in the Buyid and, and, uh, and Safavid compromises, was a, was a quiet, uh, quietest millenarian faith, awaiting the coming of its uh, Messiah or Mahdi. Uh, this return was envisioned as a kind of a mother of all uh, second comings with elements of Zoroastrian, Jewish, Christian, Islamic stories of a post-millenarian peace on earth. Uh, so Shias up until the 20th century has eschewed politics as uh, the realm of the fallen and the bailiwick of the usurpers of the divine uh, authority. But millenarianism, of course, we know is not always quietist. We know this from uh, comparisons to the American uh, Protestantism and the two varieties of post-millenarian and pre-millenarian interpretations of it, uh, the post-millenarian eschatology of earlier 20th century basically considered a peaceful transition, a gradual 
betterment of the world that many of them said had already started. So all you needed to do is to kind of prepare the ground, make the society a better place, eradicate poverty, and basically help modernity ac accomplish its task in order to gradually arrive at the second coming. Whereas the premillenarian interpretation of the same literature, same idea, uh, envisioned a rupture and a rapture, Armageddon and, and the tribulation, and a violent end of the world that many of them actually consider to be uh, entirely consistent with an atomic uh, uh, annihilation of the world and that is why most of them uh, opposed uh, nuclear disarmament as frustrating the will of God. What I'm trying to say to, by making this analogy is that uh, millenarianism with a small spin in this direction or that direction can create uh, vastly different uh, consequences and sociologists of religion uh, know this very well. So uh, when the, the Shiite theology came out of its quietest uh, period at the turn of the previous century, it first adopted a kind of a post-millenarian uh, vision of the world with the constitutional revolution. Of course, some pre-millenarian uh, elements were also simmering in that primordial soup of the constitutional revolution. Uh, but the rumblings of the Islamic State were heard throughout the Middle East in late 20th century in the wake of the collapse of Arab nationalism and uh, Muslims also were groping for a unifying ideology against colonialist incursions. Uh, this is at, this, uh, at the time that Ayatollah Khomeini in exile in Iraq started to develop the uh, ideology of a, of a Shiite uh, theocracy. Uh, he was very cognizant of actually a lot of developments in the Arab world and Hassan and Haikal who met, met with him uh, was impressed how much Khomeini knew about the developments in, in Egypt. So, I, of course, I, as you can imagine, this, this didn't go very well. Uh, the Khomeini's blueprint of a Shiite theocracy was uh, basically flopped because the Shiite uh, traditionalists, mainly Ayatollahs, uh, rejected this as a nearly heretical innovation. And the Iranian modernists saw this as a, a threat to uh, a liberal uh, vision that they had of the future of Iran and their uh, nearly century of, of struggle towards uh, a, a, a liberal and democratic society. So, uh, I mean, this is kind of not unlike the way uh, Zionism was treated by Jews. Uh, you know, religious Jews rejected initially, this is before the Second World War and Holocaust, religious Jews rejected it because it appeared to be a heresy going to create an Israel before the coming of the Messiah and, uh, and liberal Jews rejected it because it was a kind of re-ghettoization of, of Jude, Jews who wanted to join the modern world. So in the same, uh, in, in similar analogous ways, Khomeini's theory of uh, mandate of the Jewish council uh, was rejected both by the traditionalist Muslims and modern Muslims. So it is not surprising that at the beginning of the uh, revolution, when Khomeini emerged, uh, as the leader of, the, of this revolution, uh, he uh, basically shelved this idea of the Islamic government and uh, settled for a compromise that was the Islamic Republic. Uh, as you can tell from uh, its name, this is basically a republic. And uh, uh, basically the constitution that was written was very similar to a, to a regular you know, Western European constitution. But something funny happened on the way to ratification where uh, this, by basically historical accident, was uh, interfered with. Uh, Prime Minister Bazargan apparently uh, gave the constitution to Khomeini and Khomeini was willing to, to sign it. But Bazargan, being such a good liberal, decided that it had to be ratified so that the future generations would not accuse Iranians of kind of uh, creating a kind of an elite document. Uh, and, and ratifying it uh, at will, so they, he formed, he uh, proposed that this assembly of experts be uh, formed, and in that assembly, a small group of radicals took over and brought back, basically shoved back Khomeini's shelved idea of Islamic government, or al-Wilayat al-Faqih, or Iranians call it Wilayat al-Faqih, back into the liberal constitution, creating this time bomb creating this untenable, vague uh, document that uh, is the constitution of the Islamic Republic of Iran. 
So uh, the result was a kind of a representative democracy grafted onto the body of a modern Islamic theocracy, completely unique in the history of mankind. We have never had a, a, a theocracy and a democracy uh, merge into, into one, one kind of a creature. And uh, of course, uh, this uh, created, uh, this, this d decided in a very significant ways the development of the last 30 years of the, of the Islamic Republic. Most Islamic st Islamist states in Asia and Africa were created in, wake in the wake of the Islamic Republic by decree, by strong men, by coup d'etats, but Iranian Islamist state was basically uh, the result of a genuine revolution. So uh, it behooves us to kind of look at what conditions, what social and political environment and milieu allowed this uh, Islamist state to develop. It wasn't because it was only, uh, uh, you know, people's desire for Islam. There was a milieu in Iran that kind of allowed this to, to, to develop. Uh, one has to mention the fact that Muslim, there was a kind of Islamist uh, identity movement in Iran. Muslims were very much like Muslims in other countries in the Middle East were uh, seeking uh, a kind of identity. And in this, they were confronted by a very strong rival, and they were the Marxist uh, intellectuals who had their own vision of the future. And they had also not only a vision, but a kind of striking style. Uh, this was uh, uh, very attractive at the time. Imagine, this is like, you know, uh, 1960s, and uh, the Eastern Bloc is there, the Vietnam War is raging, and there is this virulent anti-Americanism and anti-Westernism. And uh, this is uh, directed against the Shah that has been uh, imposed by Americans. So the leftists had a lot of cachet. And they had something going for them, which a, 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 um, a Shiite uh, clergyman, Murtaza Mutahari, called uh, wistfully. He called it the bunkers of aggressiveness. Uh, in a book that he wrote on, on the, on the, on the uh, prevalence of materialism in Iran, uh, he, he said one of the reasons that Muslims are not really advancing is that they, are not, they don't have these bunkers of aggressiveness. And we have to take this from the, from the, from the Marxists. And indeed, that is exactly what they turned out, turned out to do. They uh, wrested the flag of opposition to the Shah from the leftists, the kind of reverse engineered the leftist uh, anti-Westernism grafted it onto some kind of ideology, Islamic ideology, and uh, the left was left behind. Uh, the, one of the major catalysts of this movement was Ali Shariati, a, a, a French educated uh, sheik intellectual, uh, who wrote a book that kind of converges very much with Khomeini's parallel invention of an Islamic state. Uh, Shariati's ideal uh, polity was kind of uh, a kind of uh, elite-led led, uh, uh, people's republic. Uh, in a pamphlet called Ummat wa Imamat, uh, Community and Leadership, he kind of invented or, or imagined a kind of centralist republic of intellectuals in Tehran, where at the same time Khomeini is developing this uh, Islamic theocracy in Najaf. And there was a kind of a convergence between these, these two. Uh, Khomeini's theological prestidigitation basically had created this, uh, this uh, idea of an Islamic state out of threads um, uh, of, uh, of some legal arguments that the uh, um, jurist, Islamic jurist, has mandate over people who don't have, uh, who co can't manage their own affairs orphans or people who are uh, not mentally capable, uh, who becomes their guardian? The, result, the answer in Islamic jurisprudence was the faqih or the jurist. And out of that mandate, Khomeini kind of expanded it uh, into the mandate of the jurist over the entire nation. And as I uh, said before, this was not very well received by, especially by other Muslim jurists, especially at the time the most learned of them, Abu Qasim al khoi who was uh, the mentor of the pre present uh, spiritual leader of Shiites who lives in Iraq, Ali al-Sistani, 
At the same time that Khomeini was developing this idea of a mandate of Jewish consul, Khoi uh, noted that this was happening and he started his lectures to refute the idea of mandate, this expansion of the mandate to, into a political philosophy for the whole society. And at the same time, this was, as Khomeini published his articles as a book, Al Khoi also art published his articles, but his was never translated into Persian, remained in Arabic, Al Ishtihadu wa Taqlid. What I'm saying is that Khomeini was basically bested by the, uh, this most learned Ayatollah in, in Najaf. So what happened that Khomeini's idea became the leading document of the Islamic uh, Republic and Khoiz was uh, consigned to the, to the shelves of, uh, of uh, libraries. It, it had to do with the environment, the political environment, the, the, the galvanized political environment in Tehran, in Iran, and the, uh, uh, the, the fashions, the fashions, the um, uh, modes of thinking that were prevalent at the time, basically emerging of Shariatis uh, revolutionary ideas for a, for a republic of the virtue and Khomeini's ideas. But at the same time, as I mentioned also, Khomeini kind of uh, took a step back, didn't want to impose this, and it was basically because of a historical accident that this came to, to pass. Now, the last uh, 30 years of Islamic Republic ends up being a kind of symbiosis between theocracy and democracy. As I said, the theocratic part didn't have much merit. So what it did, it relied on the democratic aspects of the Islamic Republic for its legitimacy. So why should people listen to this uh, system? Not because it is correct, because the majority of Ayatollahs didn't believe it was correct, and a majority of people did not uh, follow uh, Ayatollah Khomeini or, 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 or his lieutenants. They followed, and still to this day, are following uh, other Ayatollahs who don't believe in this particular vision of Islamic uh, rule. Uh, so, the way this republic survived for 30 years was uh, the fact that it could bring people to the polling stations. That is why in the last 30 years we have basically have had 30 elections, an election per year. M more elections than in most sane liberal democracies. Why? Because basically the theocratic government was addicted to this ambrosia, legitimating ambrosia of, uh, of democratic rule. Uh, so this, this was a symbiosis. Uh, the democracy kind of, as limited as it was, and Shirinabad, I don't want to go into how limited this was, Shirinabad uh, explained how uh, this uh, theocracy basically hems in the democratic aspect. But the democracy kind of remained alive within the theocratic vague structure that had been built around it, the democracy was vibrant and alive there. Now the question is, why would people, Iranian people, come and participate in this democracy? Knowing that it's kind of all, it was always rigged. But the answer is very simple. People made a rational choice. A little bit of uh, control is better than no control. The Iranian democracy was supposed to be uh, representing 100% of the population and 100% of the power would uh, devolve from the democratic processes. The theocracy that had been shoved back into this constitution took away about 70% of that power. So the two offices, the, you know, the, the presidency and the parliament that were elect, uh, the result of elections had to altogether 30-35% of the power and 70-75% went to the uh, theocratic uh, structure, supreme leader, guardian council, council of experts, uh, you know, expediency council. Why would people participate in this? Because there was no alternative and people decided that it is good to have a little bit of power than no power at all. Uh, besides, there was another reason. And Shirin Ebadi also and, and Juan uh, 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 pointed this out. There, the system was rigged. 99% of the candidates uh, in the previous election uh, and uh, in the election before that for the parliament of uh, 2008, 99% of people who want to stand for election are rejected. 
But four are accepted. Four pass go through the uh, vetting process. Now the people who are in power, they cannot only have their own apparatchiks up for election. Why? Because if they do that, people will not participate. The people who come to participate want to have at least some variety. If there is no variety, people won't participate and their legitimation uh, drops. People don't come to the polls and the system is bereft of its legitimacy. So the people who are in power had to kind of engage in what uh, in the uh, last year's uh, elections the term was coined and Mr. Abtahi, who has been on show trials lately, uh, was one of the people who popularized the term Mohandesi and the or, a, or uh, election engineering. What does it mean? It means that people who are in power have to be very careful about how they manipulate. Because if, it, if, they, are, if they use a strong hand, it becomes a, a very transparent show and people won't come and participate. If they let it go and let the democratic processes take over, gradually the offices in the parliament and presidency go to the reformers and their power is, is diminished. So they had to kind of manipulate it just so that people would not co stop coming to the polls. And on the other hand, just so that if they came to the poll, they would not have the power to uh, topple the regime or cut into their uh, in, in, into their uh, power base. And this situation uh, continued. People uh, knew that the, the system is rigged. And besides, there is a certain amount of cheating. Always in all elections, there was a certain amount of cheating that people kind of accepted. Uh, coming from Chicago, you know, Chicago, kind of Chicago politics kind of cheating. You know, dead people voting and irregularities. People are, were used to this. One of the uh, uh, slogans in this uh, demonstrations, recent demonstrations, was تقلب یه درصد, دو درصد, نه پنجا و دو درصد. That is, uh, okay, cheating, one person, two person. We are used to that. But 52 person, that's a bit too much. Uh, people were used uh, to rigging, official legal rigging. People also were used to two, three percent of, of extra legal cheating. They were not prepared for a fraudulent election that happened. Uh, and so this is, a, this is what people knew. If there is a landslide, that 2-3% uh, cheating can be overcome. This is exactly what happened with Khatami. Uh, Khatami, if you win by, you know, 70% of the vote, no amount of regular cheating can overcome that. So occasionally people wanted to do this. This is like exactly what happened in this election. A lot of people came to the votes because they decided uh, withdrawing, as they had done, kind of uh, parting their ways from the ways of the reform movement that had failed for a variety of reasons that we uh, might be able to discuss in the uh, exchange period of this uh, meeting, uh, they decided that wasn't a good strategy. Now they wanted to come and overwhelm the system again. This is why people were so taken aback, because the spirit, the way people were voting, the green movement, it was so obvious that this was another khatami uh, kind of a situation that they are going to this time overcome the uh, cheating and overcome the legal rigging and uh, somebody like Musabi could be transformed overnight into a populist leader the way, the way Khatami was. This is why people were so angry when they saw that they, they, were, they were about to win and, and have their way and, and the election was stolen from them. Now, uh, I'm going to close by uh, giving you a periodization of five periods of the last uh, uh, 30 years of the Islamic Republic and underlining how this balance between theocracy and democracy worked in these five periods. First the revolu is the revolutionary period that goes for the first decade of the revolution. People are still, uh, you know, uh, animated by the dream of the government of God that is, that, you know, from the 
uh, historical analogs, it's always very attractive, the idea that God is going to come and rule and we are not going to mess with people ruling themselves. We have had this uh, temptation indulged in various civilizations and this was very strong. This is the euphoria of the Islamic revolution was that this is going to be uh, the best of all uh, systems, the government of God is going to be more prosperous than capitalism and more uh, um, uh, more uh, just than socialism and this is going to be great just give it some time so let us kind of there is going to be some kinks so wait just wait everything is going to, to be fine and that euphoria kind of carried the revolution in the first few years and then there was an Iran Iraq war that uh, again the war fever kind of helped it um, this first revolutionary in this period uh, the symbiosis of democracy and theocracy uh, and the, the fissures really didn't appear because at this, in this period, voting was a kind of a performative act. People went to vote in order to prove that they approved of the, of the system. So there was, the fissures didn't appear between, in, in, this, in this mixed con constitution. Then comes the dramatic defeat in the Iran-Iraq war and you have the birth of the reform movement. I would argue reform movement was uh, conceived on the day that Ayatollah Khomeini drank the chalice of poison. Uh, this was his uh, way of talking about finally accepting uh, the uh, UN Security Council uh, resolution to end the war, something that he had said that he would not do. And uh, basically going back on his word that, uh, um, uh, you know, we are right and, uh, and we are not going to um, a compromise with Saddam Hussein and we are going to actually go to Baghdad and, and punish Saddam. And at that day, he took it back. At that moment, people, especially the cadre elite of the revolution, a light went on in their heads. People like such as Hajarian, who is now on show trials, one of the intellectual leaders of the reform movement. Uh, and they kind of gathered and they started to rethink all of their ideologies. And this is the, the germ the, the, the germination of the, of the reform movement. But the reform movement didn't take over after the revolutionary period. There was an interim period that we call the reconstruction period. This is the two-term presidency of, of Rafsanjani, where the idea was to kind of create prosperity uh, without democracy. And uh, all it created was crony capitalism from hell and precious little uh, uh, prosperity except for the people who are very well uh, connected. This is the period when the, where the term rantkhari uh, or uh, getting a kind of, a kind of ca the capital at this period was connect gov government connections. If you had the right connections you could become very wealthy. And of course we know that modern capitalism doesn't develop under that kind of situation. So uh, the reconstruction period comes to end with the reform period who has had 10 years to germinate and come to fruition and this is the two-term presidency of, uh, of Khatami. It is at this juncture that the fissure between democracy and theocracy becomes prominent because now people recognize, realize that they can use their votes in order to express their ideas against the government. This is when uh, the uh, Theocratic powers realize that voting is, can be dangerous. It, is, it doesn't always uh, lay golden eggs of legitimacy. It can actually create a lot of nuisance for them because now people are going to uh, look among the uh, pr uh, you know, accepted figures and pick somebody as symbolizing their views. And this is what happened with Khatami and later with Musavi and, and Karubi. So, we have three periods, revolutionary period, reconstruction period, and reform period. Uh, first is 78 to 88. The second one is basically uh, the Khatami period, uh, uh, the, the uh, reconstruction period, eight years of uh, Rafsanjani, and then the reform period, 97 to 2005, two-term presidency of, of Khatami. Then the fourth period is a neo-revolutionary or neo-fundamentalist period of, of Ahmadinejad that was, uh, again, very unexpected. Juan has talked about uh, why Ahmadinejad came to power, so fortunately I don't have to go into that and my time is almost up. Uh, 
And so basically it was, it had to do a lot with uh, the failures of the reform, disappointment of, of people in reform movement because it was unable to achieve its goal and it was uh, radically sabotaged by the right wing. And uh, uh, also the actions of the United States in the, in, the, in the region, the invasion of Iraq, the putting of Iran, of Iran on the axis of evil, and it gave rise to, uh, of course, a, a, a backlash. Now the fifth period, the last period, is basically the destruction of the Islamic Republic. By massively uh, rigging this election, they have now destroyed this symbiosis between democracy and theocracy. Basically what we have in Iran is, a, is an Islamic caliphate, uh, relying on about 10 to 12 percent of the population to suppress the overwhelming majority of the, of the Iranian population, and there is a very convincing argument that all of these show trials that we see is basically not to convince the 80-90% of the people. It's to basically uh, support the 10% of the people who are on, the, on their base. Basically, they are playing to their, to their base. They are not tr even trying to convince the, the majority of people with some of the ridiculous arguments that we have heard uh, that uh, Ahmadinejad a couple of days and Jannati have, have put forward uh, they are basically untenable suggestions that indeed it wasn't the people, it was the Basijis who were the victims. Uh, nine Basijis have been killed, they said. Okay, well, so where are the bodies of these people? You know, the Islamic Republic loves, you know, the displays of the martyrs. So what, where are these martyrs? And Janati comes out and says, oh, these nine people actually happened, all of them, to have had their wills and they asked to be buried as unknown soldiers. Uh, so, I mean, this kind of, and, and Ahmadinejad arguing that the atrocities in Kahrizak and in Evin, the rapes and murders, are the works of the agents of the reformers and foreign, foreign powers who have penetrated into the prisons and committed all of these atrocities in order to defend the Islamic Republic. So this is, the, this is where they have uh, ended that. I don't think they expect that they will be accept, this will be accepted either by the international uh, community or by the majority of Iranians, but they are kind of playing to their base. This is the end of the Islamic Republic. The giant has broken the uh, jar that contained its life. Uh, it is basically a, 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 a government, a system that is sitting on its own bayonet and uh, it's not going to last. Uh, that kind of sitting is very uncomfortable. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.